Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you just joining us, today we've got a talk by Gloetta Massey. She's a PhD student in the School of Biological Sciences here at UQ. She's supervised by Rich Fuller, um, Mandy Patterson from RSPCA and the UQ School of Vet Science, and Dr. Ella Kozpov from the UQ School of Social Science. So she's got a very interesting um, interdisciplinary project here. Um, she's also conducting this research in collaboration with two major wildlife hospitals in southeast Queensland. That's um, RSPCA Queensland Wildlife Hospital and the Corumban Wildlife Hospital. So um, Gloetta, Gloetta's talk is uh, titled, sorry, I've just got the title. It's okay, I'll have it on a slide in a minute. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> it's about wildlife rescue and the implications for, or her PhD, sorry, is about wildlife rescue and the implications for conservation and welfare. So over to you, Gloetta, thanks. Thank you, and thank you very much for the introductions and for everybody who's already done some drawings. Uh, to begin with, I just want to start with an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the custodianship of the meeting today and the lands in which we meet. Ooh, wait, clear this, all the drawings. Uh, we pay our respects to their ancestors and the descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize their valuable contribution to Australian and global society. So I just need to start by prefacing this, that this presentation contains discussions of death and images of injured wildlife. So please be aware that that could be quite confronting and keep that in mind as you go. This is not a research topic that you will walk away with, um, unfortunately with a sense of great joy and happiness, but it is one that I think, you, I hope that you'll find interesting and perhaps can find new avenues of ways of engaging. So my talk today is wildlife rescue. What are the implications for conservation and for welfare? And to just give you an overview of what I'm gonna talk about, how it's structured, I'm just gonna give you a intro about myself, talk some background, just to make sure we all have common definitions, talk about what I've discovered in my research, talk about impacts and opportunities, and then open it up for a question and answer at the end. Now to start, I'm going to ask you, this is the teacher in me, I'm going to ask you a sort of a pre-talk question and see if that changes and ask you the same question again at the end, whether or not you think there's a relevance here. So using your annotation tool, uh, you can please put a little star or a stamp on which of these statements best agrees with how you feel or which of these feelings best agrees with how you feel about that statement that wildlife rescue is too small scale to make a difference to ecosystem dynamics or conservation efforts. And I've turned names off so nobody can see what anybody says. Terrific, I'll give you about 10 more seconds if you haven't annotated yet. Great, thank you. Now we'll see how you, you are on that. It's a pretty good distribution. Interestingly, nobody strongly agrees. I've talked with people who definitely strongly agree. So it's a nice, nice change to see a variety there. Let me clear that, we'll go to the next one. Now, a little bit about me. I'm just in my second year of my PhD. This is an old photo of me. I was originally in molecular biology and, and disease focused and then expanded and moved over to other things. My research is being funded by an RTP fellowship, which is good because it's not research that I've had any success with getting grants for. So if you happen to have a lot of money you'd like to share, please let me know. And my supervisors are split between three schools at UQ, including the School of Vet Science, School of Biological Sciences, and I realized I need to put School of Social Science up there as well. And really, my, my two major collaborators are RSPCA Queensland and Corumbin Wildlife Hospital. 
uh, as well as a couple of other little hospitals with whom I speak. And I'm embedded in some ways in those hospitals. I spend two to three days a week in every single hospital or each of those hospitals. So it's a very intense experience with that. Now, background on wildlife rescue. Here's another question for you. To start with, just to share some definitions, uh, have you ever heard these statements? Do you know what the five freedoms are or the five domains? If you know what those are, the five freedoms or the five domains, click yes or no. If you're like, I know those in multiple conflict, like contexts, think of them in this context in terms of wildlife rescue or in terms of wildlife. Okay, that's, wow. All right, that's very useful information. So thank you for that. So basically, as far as I can tell, everybody's clicked no, nobody's clicked yes on that. So I'm gonna tell you what the five freedoms or five domains are very quickly so that we're on a common language when we're talking. So the five freedoms and five domains relate to animal welfare. And some people confuse animal welfare with animal rights, but it's a different thing. Animal welfare is a science and it's the science of welfare of wildlife and particularly means, or not wildlife, of any animals, and I suppose you include humans in that, the physical and mental state of an animal in relation to the condition in which it lives and dies. And so when we're talking about the five freedoms and the five domains, the five domains are a newer version of that, but it's basically that you have freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from pain and injury, freedom from fear of stress, freedom discomfort and freedom from discomfort and freedom to express normal behavior. And so if you talk to farmers in Australia, many of them would understand these five freedoms or the five domains, and it's what we're often looking at. So if you buy cage-free or free-range hens or eggs, you're looking at a process that came about because of this five freedoms. And it's that you try to make sure that animals have all of these things. And if they have all of them always, that's high quality of life. And if they trade off, that's a good quality of life to a borderline quality of life, to a poor quality of life, to a life not worth living. And in the worst case scenario, that would be say, for example, animal cruelty. So if you look here, you'll notice instantly that freedom from hunger and thirst is an absolute to have a borderline or above quality of life. And freedom from pain or injury, really you need to have that as well to have a good quality of life. But if you are both thirsty and you are in pain, you are considered to have a life not worth living or to have a life of suffering. And so that is how animal welfare looks at the scenario. And so the reason I wanted to bring this up is because my research is, is in many ways focused on welfare. And the one thing I want to say before we begin is that death as an outcome is actually a positive welfare in some cases. So if you are in extreme pain and you, are, and you can't drink and you don't have a way to eat, then death can be a welcome outcome. Uh, it can be used to relieve suffering, right? In humans, we would call this, for example, assisted death or a euthanasia. In animals, we call it euthanasia or hum humane killing, depending on the language that you're choosing to use. And so I, I really want to emphasize that when I am talking about death in wildlife rescue and rehabilitation or just wildlife rescue, that sometimes euthanasia is the best possible outcome for that animal. And so that's what I want you to keep in mind because we tend to think of death as not an ideal outcome. So then if we, just to clarify on terms of uh, how we're discussing wildlife rescue, right? So the definition that I'm using today is to provide aid to an injured, orphaned, displaced, or distressed wild animal in such a way that it may survive when released to their native habitats. People have different definitions for that. Different localities have different definitions, but that's the one that I wanted to start with. So to tell you a little bit about my research, uh, just the approach that I'm using and where I'm collecting my data is that I have one side of it or one branch that's looking at retrospective hospital data and the scientific literature. So looking at hospital records over the past five years or six years actually from the major wildlife hospitals in Southeast Queensland, as well as 1400 scientific papers. So you'll see some of the data that's been gleaned from that. Then you'll see a little bit of data from a broad public survey that I sent out, I snowballed it out. That was the link that was at the beginning, uh, back in the talk. And so 
What I would ask is after my talk, if you haven't taken the survey, that you don't take it because you will learn some of the things that are in that survey and that could skew the results if you then go and take the survey. And then lastly, I'm actually, as I said, I'm doing ethnographic research in the hospital. So I'm embedding myself. So it's very much a mixed methods approach of quantitative and qualitative data and trying to capture and to understand this area that really has minimal research at the moment. So if we think about what is the scope of wildlife rescue in Australia, how big is it? How small is it? How, how does it go? All of those things. Uh, the first thing I want you to do is uh, think about how many wild animals are rescued each year across Australia? And just write that number on the screen. Like if you, you can put it as a text or you can draw it or how many wild animals do you think are rescued across Australia each year? Great, obviously a very wide range of animals or wide range of numbers. That's terrific. It's great to see that spread. Now I really do wish you had taken the survey before if you hadn't. Well, the truth is that nobody knows. We do not know how many wild animals are rescued across Australia each year for the simple reason of there is no systematic data collection of wildlife rescues across Australia. It is done at a state by state territory level, except that it isn't as well because only the New South Wales government collects data on wildlife rescue across the scale. Uh, Tasmania collects it for some species. Queensland previously collected it, no longer collects it. South Australia doesn't collect it, Northern Territory doesn't collect it. In other words, we don't actually know the scale of wildlife rescue. Although if you put together some of the literature, you start to get an idea of scale. And in a second, you'll be able to have a clearer idea of scale as well, right? How many wildlife are released each year? We don't know. So of those animals that are rescued, how many are released across the country? We also don't know that. And where are these wildlife released? We also don't know that. Now, I put an asterisk in there in my head because, of course, obviously, whoever delivers the animal to the wild knows where that animal is going. But in mass, we don't know where these animals are going. There are some exceptions. As some animals, such as koalas in southeast Queensland, some of them are tracked. But as a rule, we don't even know where these wildlife are being released which does beg the question of, are we looking at one of the largest translocation or reintroduction experiments on the planet happening unmonitored? But we'll get to that in just a little bit. So my area of research is of course, Southeast Queensland, this tiny little section over here. Now in terms of the scope of wildlife rescue in Southeast Queensland, I can tell you that, but even that is just based on one hospital's data or two hospitals data, not all of the hospitals. So these were the total wildlife admissions by postcode to one wildlife hospital between in Southeast Queensland between 2015 and 2020. And I wanna point out that you'll notice that there are these spots here that don't have much coverage. That's because this area down here is covered by a different hospital. And this area up here is covered by a different hospital. And so I hope, can you see the, I hope you can all see the pin. But basically this hospital here is covering this region. And each of these little red represents 4,244 rescues in that postcode. So that starts to give you an idea of how many animals, each one of these of course represents one, but these are 4,000 in that one postcode and then around 2,200 in this postcode here. So you start to see the scale. Now I should say, these are only the rescues where the people brought them to a wildlife hospital. So any rescue that went to a vet is not included in this number. Any rescue that just went to a person's home and was never brought to a wildlife hospital is not included in this number. And to give you an idea of what that actually means in sheer numbers, these are the sheer numbers for the wildlife that have been rescued in Southeast Queensland and brought into one wildlife hospital since 2015. 
So in 2015, we were looking at 18,619, as you can see. Each year, it has been going up. 2019 was a smidget of an anomaly. We're still trying to figure out why. And then 2020 obviously went back up again. So the trend line is up. And this is applied to all wildlife hospitals across Australia that I've contacted. They're all seeing increases in the number of rescue wildlife that are being brought in. At the same time, local vets are seeing increases in the number of rescued wildlife that are being brought in. Now, 24,760. That's a number that we don't really process well in our head. We can't really visualize that. So I want to give you a way of visualizing, visualizing that. And that is, I want you to picture your favorite native animal that lives in Southeast Queensland. Do you have that picture in your head? Now I want you to picture that animal in the Queensville County Bank Stadium, right? This stadium holds 25,000 people. So I want you to replace each one of those people with a wild animal. And that will give you the idea of the number of wildlife that were rescued in 2020 in this tiny portion of Southeast Queensland alone. So estimates are that across Australia, between 500,000 and a million wildlife are rescued every year. But as I said, we don't know that. So last year alone, we had enough to fill this stadium. Over two years, we had enough to fill Suncor Stadium at 50,000. And over the last four years, Enough wildlife were rescued in Southeast Queensland. It's one hospital to fill the Melbourne cricket grounds. So again, if you picture every single one of those people replaced by a native animal. Now, what species are actually breaking that down? It's not a species, it's over 260 different species that are coming in. But each one of these color breakdowns represents a major group. So if we look again at say 2020, 1,346 came from this group, 6,325 came from this group, and 1,000, or sorry, 14,201 came from this group. So get ready to annotate. My question to you is which of these groups represents the orange? Annotate which of these groups do you think represents the orange on that graph? We've got a spread between the mammals, the reptiles, and the birds. Birds definitely looks like for the win on that one. And in this context, birds and birders, you are correct. The largest group that's being brought into this wildlife hospital are birds. Now, I should say the largest individual species is a mammal, and those are basically the brush-tailed possums. They're the largest number of intakes, although that's starting to get beat out by lorikeets, rainbow lorikeets in particular, as rainbow lorikeet syndrome becomes more prevalent or, be, or more people are picking those animals up. And then, yes, I see the unhappy face up there by the snake. Exactly. So there's snakes. Now the other colors that you can't see there are monotremes are also included. So the mammals is just the marsupials, but all the blue represents mammals. And then way, way down at the bottom, it's so tiny, it doesn't even fit on the scale in a visual way, are amphibians. So people also bring amphibians in as well. In fact, I just watched a, a, a green tree frog be triaged and treated two weeks ago. So if we just look at individual admissions, so these are all the native birds, just to give you again the idea of the scale here over the last six years, again, one wildlife hospital, this is not all the three major wildlife hospitals, this is native marsupials, native reptiles, native monotremes, native amphibians, right, and then the part that maybe me be of interest to you as conservation biologist is how many of these were IUCN status listed. For example, how many were endangered and how many were vulnerable? So annotate if you are, and try to figure out a way of annotating if you would be surprised to see the number of uh, sort of endangered and vulnerable animals that have been brought into this one hospital, or if you absolutely are like, oh yeah, this makes perfect sense. 
I realize I didn't put a button for that, but is this a surprising statistic for you for wildlife rescue? Or are you like, oh yes, maybe a happy face if you already knew it and a something else, an X. Yeah, that's a good one. I did not know this. Yep, knew it. Right, so a lot of people did know and then some people didn't know around that. Terrific. Now the next one is a bit of a surprise. It was a surprise to me, although maybe it won't be to anybody else. And that is the number of species that would be considered feral, right? And so these are the non-native admissions to one wildlife hospital in Southeast Queensland between 2015 and 2020. And the reason that I put these in red is that by law, uh, feral animals or non-native animals must be euthanized or uh, humanely killed when they are brought in. So even if they are perfectly healthy when they are brought in, they, they must be euthanized. They cannot be rehabilitated. They cannot be released back to the wild in Queensland. This does not hold true for other states in Australia and other states you are allowed to keep those animals as pets. And in fact, in some places, say South Australia, you're not even allowed to release animals that have been rescued. You must keep them in care and ideally not as pets, but you must keep them without ever releasing them to the wild. And so this begs the question of, you know, this whole idea of people are rescuing animals uh, with expectations that fits in this next section, as well as what happens when you remove 2,295 feral animals from an environment in a tiny little space like Southeast Queensland. Now, what are the impacts of this? So I want you just to think for a second what do you think could be some potential impacts of wildlife rescue in terms of welfare, in terms of uh, interactions with the environment or things like that? And you can use the text key and just type what you think might be some impacts. When 25,000 animals are rescued, what impacts could that have? Right, so we have everything from disease risk to exhausted wildlife carers to habituation. Yep, uh, behavior and territoriality. Something got hidden, unfortunately, there. People might not bring them in if they realize that they're being euthanized. Lack of resources, exactly. Disruption of natural selection. Overwhelmed hospital funding, welfare, inexperienced people. Yeah. Let's go ahead and have a look, see at that. Now this next one, I'm gonna show you a video clip because I really want in the front of your head as we talk about this, what I am talking about when I talk about wildlife rescue, right? So sometimes it involves something as simple as I see a turtle and I pick it up and you know, like <laughs> I see a sea, not a sea turtle, I see a turtle on the beach and then I realized, oh, it's a snake turtle. And so I take it off the beach and I put it next to a freshwater way. In a sense, that's a rescue, right? I'm taking an animal out of its habitat and I'm bringing it into human care and I'm moving it to a new area. In other cases, and in many cases, particularly around bushfires or car crashes and things, we can see something that's like this next video. So uh, just as a heads up, this can be a very confronting video. So I just want you to be aware. Please pause. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Can you get water 
So that video was of a rescue that occurred in New South Wales during the 2019 fires. And this koala was then taken to a, a wildlife hospital, it made very big news. It was actually a global news story. And uh, I don't know if you could tell from the video, but the koala's eyes had been burned and much of its face had been burned. So after being able to eat for a few hours, it was then euthanized on the second day in care. And so I just wanted to, to show you in a sense of what it means for some people to rescue, right? She stripped her shirt off, she ran into a dangerous environment, a fire, uh, she picked that animal up and, and moving it into care. So what does it actually involve and how can that impact things? So one of the things are who decides to rescue and what they rescue. So the next bit is some results from my survey already, some preliminary results. So I've uh, around 500 people have already responded. And one of the things that became very apparent is that just as that woman, right, ran in to save a koala, would she have done the same thing had it been a brown snake? Or would she have done the same thing had it been, you know, a, an animal that didn't fit her perception as worthy of being saved? You know, maybe, maybe for her, all animals are worthy of being saved. But based on the initial survey, we do have our preferences on the animals that we are willing to save. And so one of the potential impacts is what happens when you're talking about 24,000 animals when some species are more likely to be rescued than others. So across the top, these are the species that people said that they would rescue if they saw them injured or orphaned or in need of rescue. And along the bottom are the ones that people said they would not rescue. And so you can see, it's interesting in this case, right? At the top, even foxes, which are this purple here, right? Or sorry, this blue uh, would be rescued. Some people would rescue a fox in care. In other words, we have like possums are very popular, magpies, lorikeets, koalas, turtles. But in terms of what people would not rescue, this is snakes. And in the notes of the other, please specify it's bats. So snakes and bats, obviously they have risk depending if you don't you know what kind of snake it is or you're unsure about getting Lissa virus with bats, but that could have the potential when we're talking about 100,000 animals from one hospital over four to five years. What are we doing and skewing in terms of what does get rescued, what does get released again? Now with your annotation tool, which one would you rescue and which one would you not rescue? If you were to rescue an animal, if you weren't to rescue an animal at all, don't annotate it. Oh, interesting. Somebody put fox.
So even here, you can see the spread of, of what people would say, yes, I would rescue that. And, and others, uh, yeah, probably not going to rescue that one. Sorry, I delete that comment just as I'm coming in. So one impact, as I said, is that the other aspect or another impact could be this hands-on interaction, right? So wildlife rescue is incredibly hands-on. You are physically picking up the animal. Now you may use a t-shirt, you may use a towel, you may use your bare hands, and I'll show you some results from that. In this case, this gentleman is, is picking up a koala with his bare hands. Right, this is an emergency situation. He's running in, he's grabbing the koala. And uh, the other aspect is what does it do? What does it do to you as a person when you run in and pick up an animal, when you are in a, a trauma type of situation or a trauma care environment, such as a hospital, just a wildlife hospital instead, how does that impact you? And so we know already from studies that have just come out in the last few years, that there is a connection between the observation of not wildlife trauma necessarily, but trauma in animals and the impact on the mental health of the people that deal with that. So Bruce Engelfeld uh, did this study where he surveyed basically 500 wildlife carers and showed that there was a tremendous amount of grief and even some potential PTSD and looking and caring for rescued wildlife in Australia. And at the same time, this paper just came out on the basically what happens when vets are put into bushfires or put into large scale mass casualty events uh, that they had nightmares, they had all sort of, uh, again, very similar to PTSD symptoms going up for up to six months after the release. And what I can say is that when we picture a massive bushfire and that impact, right, that these people are going in, they're getting those animals, that's a very similar condition to what the vets and the vet nurses are experiencing on a daily basis in the wildlife hospitals where I am now. And so I, when I'm embedded and when I'm there, I'm watching animal after animal after animal after animal, nonstop animals being brought into the hospital that are wounded, that are in distress, that are sick, that have been orphaned, that have been bird napped, so the gamut, and then being euthanized and having to be treated and euthanized by the staff. So there's a real concern around the mental and physical welfare of the people that are taking care of these animals. And at the same time, there's a real concern around the disease spread as somebody brought up, right? So one of the questions I asked on my survey was if you asked or if you rescued wildlife, did you use any form of PPE? What did you do to protect yourself from that wildlife, right? So many people, many being still only 36%, wrapped in blankets or something around that animal to keep from touching it. But between these two results, right? The, most people are rescuing wildlife without using any form of barrier between themselves and the wild animal. And the fact that fewer than 27, well, 27% 27 or fewer have the rabies vaccine, which protects against lysivirus, and a scant 10% have the Q fever vaccine, which again protects from uh, basically rickettsia like diseases of Q fever and coccidial diseases in wildlife. What we're doing is we're having this huge opportunity for a zoonotic crossover event happening. And there's already been one study, a very small study that just came out two years ago on Q fever that showed that rescuers were more likely to have symptoms of a Q fever type infection. And so that's one of those other aspects. So besides the mental health, we also are talking about the impacts on the physical health. And so as part of my literature review, one of the things that I've worked on is trying to identify what zoonotic diseases have been identified in the literature in rescued wildlife. Now, this is not that they've been identified um, as zoonotic, but the, these are the diseases that have been found in rescued wildlife that have been brought into hospitals. And so what we have are things like plasmodiums, clepsilia, staphylococci, microplasmids, right? And then just literally today, my search alert popped up and we have this paper that just came out in the UK, right? And this one that just came out in Germany. So there's this massive opportunity, which has not been looked at in the literature yet, 
between the potential zoonotic crossover. And that is not simply from wildlife to humans, there's also the reverse. So if you take a few minutes and go into Instagram or Facebook, you'll see pictures of people playing with wildlife in terms of wildlife rehabilitation. And we know that diseases can pass from humans back into the wildlife. If those wildlife are then released back into the wild, what happens, right? So we know that there are animals that come into care that are uh, that develop or pick up a drug-resistant E. coli while they are in care, and then they are released back to the wildlife. So there's all these questions around disease and disease transmission as well. One of the other aspects is this conflict between what people think are going to happen and what actually happens. And so one of the questions I've asked people is, you know, you took the animal to the hospital. What did you expect? You took an animal to a vet. What did you expect to happen, right? So you go and you rescue that koala, you go and you rescue that snake, you go and you rescue that whatever it is you're gonna rescue and you take it to a wildlife hospital. And the majority of people around 66% believe that that animal is going to be treated and released. But the simple fact of the matter is that the majority of the animals, approximately 65 to 75 percent, depending on the species, will not be released. They will be euthanized. And so there's this conflict between what people expect to have happen and what actually happens. So these are the intake rates in green, and these are the euthanasia rates in purple. You'll notice there's a very strong seasonal effect. Summer is uh, known as the trauma season or the death season, depending upon who you're speaking with. And you'll see those very seasonal effects, but you'll see in all cases that the euthanasia rates mirror and are the majority of outcomes. So there's this conflict between that aspect and do I stop bringing an animal to the hospital if I know that it's going to be euthanized? And we know that is already happening uh, we know that there are care organizations who will refuse to bring animals in because they know that they will be euthanized, which raises the conflict of, does that person keeping an animal at home know how to care for an animal in an appropriate way, or is it decreasing or potentially harming that animal by keeping it at home? So around a 35 or 34% survival rate across all species over these four years. So you could look at that as a good or a bad thing depending. Another aspect that is the impact is this concept of where are they released, right? So we have these very tenuous release locations. By law um, in, in Queensland, or by the basically the care guidelines, you must release an animal to where it was rescued. But here's the problem with that. A, if I found an animal by the side of the road, it is highly unlikely I'm going to take that animal back to the very exact spot where I found it because that's about where it was gonna get run over. And so what we know ha is happening is that many carers are taking their wildlife and they're putting it someplace that they feel is more appropriate. But that's the question is how do we define what is more appropriate? If a possum is accustomed to living in my attic and I take it and I set it free in a national park, how does that possum know how to cope? And so that's one of the questions. The other thing is once an animal has been in care, how long can it be in care before it impacts its abilities to reintegrate, right? If I take a male possum out of its home for a month, by the time it gets back, is its territory gone or is its, has it been pulled back over by other possums? And so we don't know that. There's absolutely no post-release monitoring other than for koalas for most species that are being rescued and then rehabilitated and released. And that's, as I said, one of the big questions is, what do we mean by native habitats? This possum, for example, if she gets rescued and then they go, oh, well, we wanna put her back someplace nice, so we're gonna put her into a national park. If you dropped me into a national park without any training, I'd be dead, much like this urban possum. So that's one of the questions. Uh, and this was a study that was done in 1996, one of the very few post-release studies that have been done, and they took sort of urbanized possums that had been rescued and then hand raised, and then they put them into a national park. And while they were like, yay, great, an average of 182 days of survival, I'd like you to check out what the median survival was for those rescued animals. So people are taking these animals in, they're paying out of their own pockets to care for them, to raise them, 
And then in turn, they're releasing them into places that they think will be better, but the animals die quite quickly. Either they're eaten or they're, they starve to death or it just depends on the study that you look at what the results were. Uh, this is one of those pictures from that study that was what was left of the possum when they found the, one of the pythons that had eaten it. So I guess the big question here is, well, gosh, Lolita, with all of this really terrific and uplifting information, should we just stop wildlife rescue altogether? And that question of should we or should we not rescue wildlife is actually a bit of a moot question because people are going to rescue wildlife. People will rescue wildlife. They will put themselves in harm's way to rescue wildlife. And so what I'm proposing is that we apply a harm reduction framework to look at this in the same way that we know that people will drink alcohol. How do we reduce what the potential harms are that? How do we make it safe? Sunscreen is a way to go out safe into the beach, right? Don't drink and drive or don't drive drunk, right? These are ways of harm reduction. And the other aspect of it is, and this is my main motivation for talking today, is to connect people to this research. So to get scientists to be interested in it, to start paying attention to it, to look at ways like, oh, wow, I have an honor student who'd really like to do X. There's so much data. There's so much available research, be it on behavior, be it on translocation, be it on reintroduction, be it on disease, be it on a social science aspect of it. And I am this one of these little lone researchers out there screaming in the wilderness. So if you are thinking to yourself, I'd like to expand what I do, please get in touch. I can connect you with my networks. They are uh, dying to have people look at their research and participate and, and be involved in it. So there's my motivation there. And the other thing besides that is this number, right? So purely from a, a, a conservation perspective, that these numbers of animals that are coming in, right? So these vulnerable species, this is the number that got released back. We don't know if they survived because I said we don't have post-release monitoring, but that number of animals coming through, 34% survival rate for vulnerable animals that had been rescued by private citizens and brought in. That's better than many outcomes for many conservation programs. So how do we make it better, make it more successful, do what we need to do to improve those processes. Whew, now I should probably breathe. Now I just want to go ahead and ask you now that exact same question. Given all of that and the numbers and what I've talked about, do you still think or where do you think or is there any change on this statement, wildlife rescue is too small scale to make a difference to ecosystem dynamics or conservation efforts? Big check mark. <laughs> thank you for thank you for answering that and for your interaction. That makes this so much easier for me. I just want to say thank you now. There's references here if anybody wants them. And open it up to questions. Please ask questions. I have a I'm, always want to talk about my research, not even just about my research, but just to get people excited for it. 